We're here at the 2016 Ace Eddie Awards. I'm here with Chris Carter, creator, screenwriter of The X-Files. First of all, thank you for bringing it back. Uh, thank you. It's nice to be back, believe me. Tell me, it's, it's been, what, 20 years? What's, what's the biggest change for you coming back into this, uh, this X-Files universe? Well, you know, the idea, of course, is not to change it too much. You know, it was, um, it, it was a, a storytelling uh, that worked originally, and we've got to tell those same good stories. Uh, technologically, people want to know how it's changed, how technology has changed what we do. I can tell you for the first time we shot only on, with digital cameras. Uh, we still, we've been editing on the Avid f since uh, the show began nearly, you know, for me, 24 years ago. Uh, so uh, that technology, while it has improved greatly, believe me, uh, you, we used to do a, uh, a dissolve and we had to go away for a couple hours. Uh, that has changed yes. clearly, yes. Yeah, the, uh, the render break is a thing of the past now. Yes, exactly. So tell me about your process working with editors. Uh, are you uh, very hands-on? Do you uh, let your editors do, your, do their thing and then you work with them that way? Or? Yes, uh, you know, a good editor is a good storyteller. A good editor has ideas uh, of his or her own. In this case of the X-Files, uh, they call it a reboot. Uh, we had a, both a, uh, uh, a woman and a man editing. The woman had actually been a, a, one of the original editors on the series. She came back, Heather McDougall, uh, knows the show inside and out. You want to hire somebody who you've worked with before. There's a shorthand involved. Rob Kamatsu, the, uh, the other editor, is somebody I'd worked with before. So I got to work with people not only in editorial, but uh, in, in many of the technical uh, uh, jobs. Going postal here at the 2016 Ace Eddie Awards. I'm here with Kevin Nolting, who's the editor of one of the best films of the year, Inside Out. Congratulations on a, on a fantastic film, sir. Thank you. Animation's such a long process. How long for this movie were you on it? For I was on it for five years. I started in 2010. That's, that's a long haul to be committed to one project. And in a, a film like Inside Out, what, uh, what was your biggest takeaway coming out of that film? Well, for me, I, I moved my two daughters up to San Francisco when they were nine. One of them was nine years old. And so the first time she saw the movie, she just turned to me and said, this is my, this is my story. So it's very personal for me. And when your family can claim a sense of ownership as well, it really adds that personal touch. Definitely. Going postal here at the 2016 Ace Eddies, I'm with Tim Porter, nominated for Game of Thrones. Tim, going into a, like a huge show like Game of Thrones, what's, what's the biggest challenge for you as an editor? Um, just, um, I don't know, just making it look great every week and not letting, you know, not letting everyone down. And, um, yeah, just, just making sure that the standards are kept. Just keeping it, keeping the shop open, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. It's not about me, is it? I mean, it's a brilliantly written show, as everyone knows. Great directors. Uh, it's my job to um, bring it all together, right? You can take a little bit of the credit, because it's like it can make or break in the edit room as well. I believe so, yeah, sometimes. But I don't know. Not really this show so much. It is, you know... It, it has its story arcs that are going over several seasons, and so we don't do anything too radical other than work with great material. Keeping the story going in these big action scenes is where you have elements, plates, green screens, yeah, previs. Because you, you put it together as your assembly, don't you? And like, you have time to do this stuff. You don't have to make all your choices in one day, do you? So you build it as it's shot, as it's written, as it's prevised, as it's storyboarded as the amount of shots you're supposed to have in the sequence without creating, you know, hugely expensive new shots. And then you see if it works and then you do your editing thing, don't you? I'm here with Stephen Schaefer, editor of one of my favorites of the year, The Good Dinosaur. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Tell us about some of your experiences on the film and what you took away from it. Well, I mean, it, it was a unique experience for me. Certainly, um, you know, we, we, had a, we had a kind of a, a mid-production shake up where we kind of changed a lot of things and then we basically went for a, a you know a, a full rewrite and so we myself with the director we basically put 
together a four-year process in two years. So, you know, it was uh, fast and furious. The, you know, you don't, uh, so at that pace, you don't really get a lot of time to craft a scene. You're basically, you know, kind of slapping it together and showing the director and, and you know, the exact, whoever, you know, we need to see to, to get approvals. And then, you know, so that took a lot of imagination from our executives, certainly from John Lasseter. You know, he, he had to, you know, things weren't as polished as, as they normally would be in the story, storyboard phase. And so then we would have to, you know, kind of come up behind the, the, the scenes that we were pushing forward and fine tune them and kind of craft the sequence as it's moving into production. So it was, it was a little nerve wracking because you have this sequence that you're pushing forward into production that you're not fully confident in yet, but you have to push it forward because it's got a release date and we have a schedule and we have to get it out. But knowing that I will have an opportunity down the line, down the production line, to, to you know tweak the things we want to tweak and fix it. So that was a unique thing. You know, normally these films take four years to make. So you know, the, the, the accelerated schedule was probably one of the biggest hurdles that we had to make on the film. Do you find working in such a, an accelerated schedule that you, you find bits of creativity that you never knew? Absolutely, and, it, and it, the, those kind of little gems come out of necessity. Like you, you can't, a lot of times, you know, we, we can work and rework and hem and haw about certain things because we have time. On this show, we didn't have time, so it was really, it was much closer to a live action kind of kind of film than, than animation, just because of that time crunch. And like you said, we were able to find some little things that we probably wouldn't have if, if we didn't have that, that accelerated schedule. Now, having just been through it, would you do it again? I would do it again. Actually, I was just commenting to, to uh, some folks here tonight that I kind of I kind of like the um, just the, the the whole process of the accelerated schedule. You're done the movie in two years. Um, you know, it, it's just like I said before. It's a little closer to live action. Um, there are certainly things I miss not having the full run. You know, there's things that you can work and rework that we just didn't have time to do on The Good Dinosaur. Well, best of luck tonight and at the Oscars. Oh, thank you very much. Here at the Ace uh, Eddie Awards 2016 with Stephen Mirioni, nominated for The Revenant. You've had a pretty varied career. This, I, I would guess going into this film was a pretty big challenge. Lots of natural light. How, like, did you have a lot of footage to play with? Oh, yeah. We, I mean, I had... Uh approximately 200 hours of, uh, of material shot over the course of 100 days nearly. So, so yeah, no, there, there was no lacking in uh, really beautiful, incredible uh, source material. And I guess that we talked about with Natural Light, what was your biggest challenge, I guess, with the 200 hours? Was that the challenge or what, what was your biggest takeaway coming into that? No, I think the, the, the challenge was really finding the pace and the rhythm of the movie because you know so much of the uh, so much of the movie uh, was shot with these choreographed scenes that had a lot of you know just uh, really uh, a balletic uh, uh, movement and the movement of the crane being able to take that and be bold and leaving those things but then also be able to mix that with the more improvisational scenes where they showed up they had an idea what they wanted to do and Alejandro uh, just kind of was, you know, shouting out, get this, get this, get this, and, you know, the actors were rolling with that, and Chivo, of course, our fabulous uh, DP, was rolling with that, and, you know, being able to take all that and make it all feel like it's part of the same movie, that was the, the challenge. And I guess having more footage as well gives you a chance to, if you need to re retweak in the, in the edit, you have more choice. Oh, yeah, you know, you, having a lot of footage means you can have a lot of freedom to change things, to be expressive, to change point of view, to really follow the path that the movie takes you down. And that, you know, that was the thing that Alan Alejandro and I in the editing room, uh, you know, just found so many moments that, that weren't planned. And, and that's what really elevates it beyond, uh, you know, just, just the movie it could have been to, to what it is, I think. 
Well, best of luck tonight and at the Oscars. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. I'm here with Joe Walker, who is the uh, no nominated editor for Sicario. Now, Joe, you, had, you come from a sound background too, don't you? Well, originally I, I studied music and I was in bands when I was, you know, a, a kid. And, uh, and then I sort of ended up in sound editing and I wrote music for a living for a long time. And uh, I always kept the two things sort of the, try to keep both plates spinning and then eventually I had to kind of choose one. And um, really with editing I found I was less, I always felt with composing I was in orbit around a production. It could be quite lonely and a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, there's an orchestra, it's going to cost thousands and thousands and you better be ready by. And, you're, and until that moment you're kind of in your own silo. Exactly. I, I can remember sort of not hearing from a director for three days after I delivered a, a temp score and uh, being in a pool of sweat, a paranoid mess, you know, because I hadn't heard. And then when I rang him, he said, oh, I haven't heard it yet. I'll give you a call. You know, for him, it was nothing. Whereas, you know, in a cutting room, a day goes by and don't talk to the composer. It's no big deal. Yeah. It's yeah. like when we, when we deliver cuts for TV, it's like, come on, is it that we need to know? Does it suck? Does it, uh, what can we do? Time's a ticking. So I kind of, I, I, you know, plumped for editing and I think I've uh, I made a good choice and, you know, I've sort of had a, a good run and I've come to live in America now and, um, you know, that's been, yeah, no, some good breaks and Sicario was really amazing, amazingly good material to edit, you know. I mean, Roger Deakins and those performances were something to work with, really. Where are you from in the UK? London. I'm a Londoner. I lived there for a long time. So. Yeah. Whereabouts did you live? I lived in Chiswick. Chiswick? Oh, well, I'm Ealing. I'm, I was very nearby. Ah, right near each other on the uh, central line, right? That's right. They used to call it the queen of the suburbs, I think. <laughs> and so now you're here. Yeah. You're uh, working on American films. What's, uh, I guess, what's the biggest difference working in their, the UK industry as opposed to the US? Well, I suppose there's a scale difference. Uh, I mean, like, you don't get those kind of films where you have that collegiate two or three editors working on a project. I mean, I spent a year with Michael Mann and you know, at any one time there were three editors. So it was a sort of, um, you know, it's a, just a different of scale. I mean, it's still storytelling is storytelling. And, you know, working hard is working hard. I mean, I worked very hard when I was doing little magazine shows and learning my craft in my 20s, you know, so it's, it's there's no difference. But uh, I just, I think it's a matter of scale. And I think working on those shows and moving up that way, you learn speed and you, you, learn, you learn your craft, you learn storytelling, no matter what form it takes. You know, and also you can't predict where your break is going to come from. I mean, I always tell students and, you know, that you have to kind of keep plugging away as if it's the best thing and you will get your recognition for it because my break into drama came totally unexpectedly. I was um, working on a clip show um, about, uh, it was called Queer Spotting, and it was about... Um, uh, sort of how uh, gay people have been portrayed in comedy and drama over the years and it was really no budget half hour show but I threw myself at it and I, I, I sort of edited a title out of nothing and I found them some music and I was just work, worked very hard to make it work and uh, it just so happened totally unbeknownst to me the producer was uh, married to a producer of a, uh, a comedy drama series and was looking for an editor and you know, that was my break. I, I couldn't have planned, planned or predicted that. Yeah, it's just, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Like, uh, I was talking to Eddie Hamilton, do you know? Yeah. yeah. And he was telling me the story how he would send Kit Kats when he was starting out as a runner. He would send them chocolate as a way of remembering him. I did once, somebody once uh, sent me a, a, a kind of wall chart of the different shades of tea that they could make for me. I, I never, I didn't go for that. I always thought, well, that's, it's a nice joke, but... Uh, T is the least of what I need from an assistant, you know. No, well, that's exactly right. Going back to Sicario one last time, um, your, back, your background and sound really showed up in the film. Lots of set sequences where minimal sound, very little sound at all, and that's the way you brought it in. It just added to the tension in a way that, for me, it was just unbelievable. Thank you very much, yeah. No, it's really nice to see that recognised. I mean, you know, I... I it was also, you know, it was a very bold decision. I mean, when I first met Denis Villeneuve, the first thing we talked about in an interview was about an approach to music. We were talking about how I was working with music on 12 Years a Slave. And I was finding there that we were trying to, you know, experiment with not using temp music until very late. 
and trying to kind of only work with the composer rather than imposing a load of temp tracks. Because you become married to the temp music after a while. You can't avoid it. And also, it's sometimes it really blurs where the storytelling is lacking, you know, because sometimes it's the music that's propelling you and not the story. So it's, it's a very tough decision to make, and you have to have a very brave director who's prepared to go for six, seven weeks of a fine cut without um, any crutches. But it, what it does is it made the collaboration so fruitful because we sent a, a tabula rasa, a completely clean slate, to Johan Johansson, and his response was totally unclouded by our attitude to what a good piece of music would have been. So I think we got a really original score out of it. You know, I love the score Johan wrote for Sicario, and it was great to see it evolve because it just started with sending him a little sequence and then him sending something back and us sending him an edit of that back and then him sending us back. And, and so it built and built and built, you know. And when you edit that way, you really have nothing to hide behind. If you don't get, if the story doesn't work without music, it's not going to work with music. It's true. It's a really, it's very, it doesn't work for every project, but it worked for us on this one. Well, congratulations. Best of luck tonight and at the Oscars, and uh, we'll, we'll see you inside. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you.